They interfere through institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. They interfere by ensuring that our economic infrastructure is beholden to theirs through dollarization. They interfere through education. They interfere by influencing our processes, by lending us advisors who tell us what to do. The neo-colonial project is alive and well and it is at its most dangerous, and we Africans must smell the coffee. If we don't, they are going to continue to interfere. How else do they interfere? Through NGOs, Danida, SIDA, UKAID, USAID. These are Trojan horses that are introduced into our countries for the purpose of influencing our processes, and they infiltrate our institutions. Right now, if you look at the African Development Bank, look at the shareholding. He's Americans, he's Germans, he's Japanese, he's the French. And the Europeans have done their bit. They also interfere through post-colonial institutions, the commonwealth of independent nations. They are not sovereign states, former French-speaking nations. These are the instruments that they interfere through. And how do we then deal with this situation? We Africans must now begin to recognize, and this was recognized as early as 1963, and the chair of the commission is here. They'll be celebrating 60 years in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And 60 years ago, on the 24th day of May, Kwame Nkrumah warned us. He said, if we are not united, they are going to interfere with us militarily. They are going to interfere with our economy. They are going to interfere with our agriculture. They are going to interfere with our health. Our duty, and I hope that when African heads of states and government meet in Addis next week, it will not be another jamboree at which pro forma speeches are read. I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa Agenda 2063, I hope it will be an occasion to give meaning to Africa continent of free trade area. I hope it will be an occasion to revitalize the Malabo Declaration, the Maputo Declaration, the Yamasukru Declaration. In other words, we Africans, as I conclude, we Africans must stop operating in silos. Rwanda alone will not confront them. Burundi alone will not confront them. But if we go through the regional bodies and ultimately the African Union, we may indeed succeed in putting away this bulwark. And remember, it is no longer just Europe. There is a new scramble for Africa. The Chinese are here. The Turks are here. The Qataris are here. All of them are coming back. And the military basis that you see here is telling you that if you don't behave, we are going to use force. Sometimes I wish, and I'm saying this seriously, that we too had a nuclear weapon, because that is what Europe and America understands. The impact of European and American and Russian and Chinese interference is a raw wound. It is not something that is in the past. It is something that is happening as we speak. And therefore, when we speak to it, we are speaking to it to warn ourselves of the reality. When we speak about the Danidas and the NGOs, these are bodies whose raison d'etre is to ensure that we remain in a perpetual state of begging. That is what we are doing to warn ourselves. And we are not for one minute saying that we will shut ourselves out from the rest of the world. What we are saying is that we must define how we engage with the whole world. And we are saying that as individual countries, we are weak and the rest of the world wants to operate and to deal with us in our weak state. The United States of America dealing with Rwanda on second-hand clothing. Rwanda cannot resist them. Burundi cannot. Kenya cannot. 
Uganda cannot. But if we are East Africa with a population of 300 million, we can. If we are Sadak, we can. If we are Ikowas, we can. So this is what we are saying. And we are saying further that going forward, we must also recognize our internal weaknesses. And what is our weaknesses? Chinua Achebe said it very well. The problem of Africa is simply and squarely one of political leadership. The rank of many political leaders in Africa are thieves. Let's call them by their name. They are thieves. They are individuals who are not interested in the interest of this country. And as long as we continue electing such individuals into positions of power across Africa, they are going to be manipulated. What then is the responsibility of the citizenry? The responsibility of the citizenry is to make demands. The chairman here, I hope he has received the several letters that I've written to him. I've written several letters to his organization talking about the role of the African Union in peacemaking. I wrote to, this, to the chairman only one, last week about the situation in Sudan saying we must solve our own problems. And I want to see a crusading African Union so that it's not the Americans and the Saudi Arabians who are summoning them to Jeddah. It should be in Addis Ababa. In a nutshell, Joe, what I'm saying is that we have a responsibility to ourselves, both at the leadership level and at levels of the civic society. We must be engaged in a positive manner and we must keep on shouting without being diplomatic because diplomacy is lulling us into a false sense of security. And lastly, I want to say this. When foreign powers come, we must always be reminded of these goodies that they bring to us. It used to be said of the Trojan War that even when the Greeks bear a gift, they do not mean well. They never mean well. And the sooner we say it, recognizing the external threat, recognizing the domestic weaknesses, the safer we are. Right now, as I conclude, there is a group of experts going around East Africa, collecting views about the constitution of East Africa. I've just written to them this morning. They are leaving Kenya. If you ask 10 Kenyans, possibly only one knows they are in Kenya. Then they will be going to Burundi. If you ask your typical African about Africa Agenda 2063 out of 10, if two know about Africa Agenda 2063, you'll be lucky. If you ask them about the Africa Continental Free Trade Area 10, if two know, you'll be lucky. In other words, we are not doing well. And I'm going to be blunt at these functions. If you ask the chair of the African Union, who funds the African Union, possibly 60% of the budget is externally funded. He who pays the piper calls the tune. That is the reality of the world. We must begin to pay for our own things in order to be understood and to be respected. In other words, Africa recognizes the need to define herself and to define her agenda. And I do not begrudge nations that define themselves and their agenda. Ronald Reagan once said it, and I agreed with him, that every nation does what is in her best interest. And I have no problem with that. The problem that we have is that at critical moments in African history, we have failed to seize the moment. You will remember in 1917 at the Shamparan campaign, Mahatma Gandhi told Charlie Andrews, I do not want you to participate because at this point in time, the Indians must believe that they can do it themselves. In other words, there comes a time in the history of a nation when even friends of goodwill must be told, keep aside. We want to believe that we can do it and your help must be surreptitious and subterranean if you are a person of goodwill. And the Shamparan philosophy is what we must define for ourselves. In the year 2005, 
the former Prime Minister of Britain, Tony Blair, put together 17 individuals in what was then called the, our common interest. The report on the African Commission. The Prime Minister, he was then the President of the European Union from which Britain has now left, and he was also the President of uh, the G8 at that time before the exclusion of Russia. They produced the report. Right now, when I see the Blair Institute moving around Africa, they are implementing exactly what was in that particular report, and I have a copy of it, not for the benefit of Africa, but for the benefit of the Institute. And what they have done is to sugarcoat it and camouflage it for the purpose of hoodwinking Africa and for the purposes of creating an environment which benefits foreign companies to the detriment of the continent of Africa. So that some of these engagements are anodynal. They simply lull us into a false sense of security. Do I blame them? No. That is why I agree that we must decolonize all learning. You, we, you know, I don't know who said it this, that, that if you have a, that the happiness of the slave is the comfort of the slave owner. And, and I'm saying that if Africa does not recognize this, then Africa will never recognize and realize our potential. The saying goes that if you behave like grass, goats will eat you. And many times we in the African continent behave like grass and we are fit for eating. And that is what I'm saying going forward in a strategic engagement such as this. It is incumbent upon the continent of Africa. And remember I said there is a new scramble, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle. There was one month in this continent when the Russian foreign minister was here, the American foreign minister for here was here, the Chinese foreign minister was here, the French president was here, the Turkish president for, was here, when, within a period of two weeks. What were they looking for? What is in their best interest? They engage little countries. They don't want to engage the East African community. They don't want to engage SADAC. They don't want to engage ECOWAS because when they are big, they are not manipulable. And when on the 14th and 15th days of last year, the African heads of states and government were summoned, and I use the word summoned very deliberately to Washington, D.C., after the president had spoken to them and given them photo ops, they were given, Africa was given 60 billion, 54 countries, 60 billion. And then the American president started engaging in bilateral agreements with Burundi, with Lesotho, with Kenya. That is what we are saying that going forward we must be conscious and as to training our own Ngugi Thiongo in a book called The River Between, tells his lead character, Waiyaki, go unto him, learn what he has taught you, but bring it home and customize it for the benefit of our people. Learning is universal and defies geography, but there is wisdom in using that learning for our benefit. And very lastly, how do we distinguish the institutional conceptual West, which is diabolical, and the individual members of those countries that actually sometimes are on our side. Institutionalized conceptual West, as articulated through government, is fundamentally diabolical. Their pretension to the contrary notwithstanding. And therefore, when we engage with them, we must have our guards up. We are capable, in my view, of discerning who is better, and that is the duty of our leadership. Our leadership doesn't do a good job out of it, and that is why the demand from the civil society, the demand from academia, must remind leadership at all times, you are dealing, you are dining, and I'm using this as a term of art, that when you are dining with the devil, you must do so with a long spoon. Thank you. That is all from today's video and I hope you liked it. Subscribe for more content like this and hit like button to assist this channel grow. Until next time, keep safe.